All right. Well, hello, everyone, and good morning. Uh, welcome to our December 2023 recap, and Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. We're in 2024 now. It's so exciting. It's I don't know uh, how that last year flew by so quickly, but here we are. Um, I'm Amanda. I'm going to go through our USAS uh, releases first. And then um, we'll talk about USPS, we'll talk about inventory today. Uh, so let's get started. Um, I'm on our December 2023 recap page, but uh, let me just go back just for good measure and show how I got here. So uh, if we're on the main page of the wiki, I'm scrolling all the way down here to our SSDT meetings and trainings. And then I'm going to do some scrolling again to get to the bottom here. We have our release recaps and um, we are, even though today's date is in 2024, we're looking back at our last month of 2023. So we're going to be in there today. And then, um, you know, for future release recaps, those will be in this calendar year 2024 folder. So we're going right in here and to December. Okay, so for the USAS side, we had two releases. There were two regular releases in December. Uh, we had version um, 8.87, 8.88, and um, we have a couple of things to go over from them. The first one here that I want to talk about is Fund 495. So uh, per AOS, we've added 495 as an available fund to use um, in the USAS software. It's a career technical construction fund. And um, so the purpose is, is um, defined as a fund to account for grant monies received through Ohio through the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission to assist with facilities construction projects that support establishing or expanding expanding career technical programs under OFCC's career technical construction program. So that's the official purpose. Uh, classification as a governmental fund type and um, it's a capital projects fund type. So in general, you know, your districts will know when, when they're intending to use this. Uh, if they go to add in funds, this is now valid and uh, they're able to go ahead and create a cash account, any underlying accounts that they need um, with that fund type or with that fund number. One thing that I just, I kind of threw this on here because we've had a couple tickets about it. So I have this note and I just wanted to include it and kind of talk through it um, basically on what I've, you know, found so far um, for the questions that I've had, because uh, my understanding is that uh, when they had sent out to the districts like a notification of this fund, they gave some example like accounts on it. And so for the revenue side, for the state revenues, they uh, they said um, they used this receipt code basically in the example. And so a couple districts had went and tried to use that receipt code to create an account to create their revenue account and they get a validation error from USAS. So I looked into the validation error, like I looked into the error that people were getting um, that was reported. And so it's the account validation rules. And what I found is I found a mention that previously, and I want to say oh, it dates back to like 2011 or something, um, the, the rules that apply to this re receipt code series require a full four digits. So like that last digit can't be zero. And that is not just for this new fund, like that's a rule for any fund that they try to use a receipt code um, in that, I think it's specific to that series for. So um, generally the validations, like that kind of thing that would be in our software, like a validation like that requiring four digits would be something that would have resulted from AOS or ODE guidelines. Um, I don't see anywhere that that's changed. Um, so my interpretation, you know, what was sent to me that like the districts had gotten versus like what I was able to see on our end is my interpretation is that they may have just used that as like an example to say it needs to be in that series. Um, 
because there's a whole section of these codes that are underneath that 3210 um, that can be used. And it just depends on which one they want to use. So, um, so I figured I would I would include that. Um, certainly, if your districts are hearing differently that they should be directed to use that code, then let us know. We can um, look further into it. But everything that I'm seeing right now leads me to believe that using one of these codes um, would be fine. The uh, 3219 receipt code is listed as like a other type. So generally. Uh, using a receipt code that has like the zero at the end, like that's because it's kind of like less defined, right? Like it's not one of those specific other codes. And so that would kind of be the purpose of having that, um, having that like, I guess less, less defined code, sorry, not to be too repetitive, <laughs> but, um, but in this case, if they have one that is defined as other then like anything that doesn't fit in the other, in the, um, the for the the other codes <laughs> would be able to uh, possibly be able to use this code instead. So that would be my thought. Um, obviously, like you know, if they need to check with their auditors on this or something like that, you know, I'm um <laughs> not the not the final say on what codes that they should be using. But this is what I found based on like what the software has in place. Like if they did try and use this 3210, they would currently get a validation error. And so I kind of just wanted to talk it through because if they come to you asking about it, <laughs> I just thought that might be um, some good information to have. Okay. So now that we've talked all about account codes, let's switch over here, uh, switch gears and talk about 1099s. And um, okay, so we have uh, the 1099 correction procedures have been improved to accommodate correction 1099s for vendors that received a 1099 in error. So, um, and there's a couple layers to this. Uh, if the correction type 1099 is selected, users will be required to have selected at least one vendor in order to process the 1099s. And um, this changes to enable users to comply with error type one in the IRS documentation. Now, uh, we are going to do a training at the beginning of next month where we're going to actually talk through um, W2C and 1099 corrections. So I'm not going to go into like the whole process here, but uh, I wanted to just show you like kind of the basics of what was added with this update. So first, let me just go ahead and click on this. Oh wait, that's the that's uh <laughs> um that's the IRS one. I'm so sorry. I guess I need another sip of coffee here. So the IRS documentation does have what well, it does have that in the section, but uh let me let me go to our wiki because that's what I that's where I was uh <laughs> had in my head that we were going. Um so uses documentation and um, I'm going to go to our uh, periodic 1099 extracts and our corrections. So mostly what I want to show here, let's see, oh goodness, it's on corrections, okay. So um, there are two types of corrections, type one and type two. And then um, within, and, and this is probably why I actually had this linked because there, there's like a more specific um, little table within here. And I'll tell you what, I, I was thinking I wanted to show it, but I don't want to go scroll through this IRS documentation on you <laughs> um, this morning. So we'll hold off on that. I'll have screenshots ready for when we um, have our actual training on this. But the important part is that there are specific requirements that um, you need to generate um, the correction forms based on what needs corrected. Okay, and so what I'm talking about when I mentioned that type one and type two, it's basically like type one is if it has, you know, certain things incorrect and type two 
is if it has, you know, this incorrect, like if the tax ID number is incorrect and there are different steps based on what that situation is. Um, one of the situations in the type one is they issued a 1099 to a vendor that wasn't supposed to get a 1099. So just the general. And so what this update did is it specifically accounted for that situation because what they need to do to send a correction for that is they need to send a 1099 with all with zero dollar amounts. Now, the 1099 program in general is very smart where it is trying to pull vendors that qualify, right? So you have the different um, selection and let's go look at the 1099 program. You have the different ways to select, uh, you know, for what which uh, vendors qualify in those 1099s. And so previously it was basically ruling out any vendors that had zero dollars. <laughs> So this update allowed uh, you to fix that. So um, so see when we're selecting through here. And then we have our vendors. And then at the bottom, we have amount type limits. And so there are, you know, I, I don't want to go too deep into this. I know I keep saying that and then I keep talking, but <laughs> uh, let's go back here. So first of all, first of all, this only applies if the district will submit 1099, the 1099 file to IRS is checked. So if we come back here, the system configuration, this right here, and we have this checkbox for the district to submit. So if this is turned on, then that's when in our 1099 extract, that's when we have this submission type right here. Okay, and then if the submission type is correction, if it's set to correction, that's when this is going to apply. The other thing I want to say, the correction forms, you really only need to use those like after the original 1099 submission has already been sent, the 1099s have already been sent. So this conversation is a little bit preliminary right now because, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure like we're, we're pretty much in the time frame where the original submission uh, and then like the electronic IRS um, file is, you know, either not sent yet or it could be resent. So we're not going to be using this till later, but we wanted to make sure it was there. Okay, so submission type is correction. And then the last part with this update and, it, and we'll go out, I'm going to try and keep holding, <laughs> do my best to hold off here on talking too much further about um, the details that we're going to discuss in the further training as to like how to actually do this process. But the other thing relevant here is if correction type is selected, users will be required to have, to have selected at least one vendor, okay? So if you are in here and Um, let's do this. So here's my vendors. If I have this set to correction, then when I go to generate, it's going to tell me submission type correction selected. You must select at least one vendor to proceed. So um, again, if I had the original file, the first time they're processing through this, it's not going to make them select. Uh, but basically we need to select one. Um, if they do have like a situation where they have multiple correction forms that they're filing, like they can use, um, if I hold control on my keyboard, they can select multiple and move them over. If you hold shift, you can select groups and move them over. So it can totally be more than one. Basically, just they have to select something. And the reason for that is because when we talk further through like what this actual process looks like, um, they can generate 1099s for vendors that have zero dollars. So uh, so basically that's to prevent them like changing to this correction form, trying to produce one for zero dollars. And if they forget to select the one or the handful that they're trying to do it for, then it would be trying to generate a file for all possible vendors. And we didn't want that to be like a possibility. So 
So basically it just, it tells, in, in my experience, if they're creating a correction form, they're probably going to have just specific one or, you know, specific vendors that they're doing it for. So I don't think that this will actually be like, <laughs> you know, something that's going to be too inconvenient um, or something that they'll even necessarily run into that often. All right. Any questions about that? I'm so sorry. I feel like I was a little bit like, I'm like ready to talk about the whole correction process. And I'm like, I know we shouldn't go too far into that part today. I'll save it. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Next, we have implemented the ability to delete requisitions uh, with a workflow approval status of approved without having to reopen the posting period. Um, that's associated with the requisition date. And uh, all that to say, basically, um, we talked about um, the ability to delete requisitions in a closed posting period. Pat talked about that on a previous release recap. And um, one thing we found uh, once uh, this started being used in practice is that um, when we're looking at the requisitions, okay, let's go to our requisitions. Hmm. There it is. Okay, so when we're looking at our requisitions, First of all, if we're going to be deleting them, they can't be converted. So I'm gonna go ahead and put false in there. And I have my workflow approval status on this grid because if we're gonna delete requisitions in a prior period, um, this also they also have to meet the other uh, qualifications. And you know, Pat talked through those before. I linked them in that release recap page. Uh, basically, there's a rule that needs to be turned off the pre-encumbrance module cannot be on. And then if the if the district uses workflows, then the status cannot be in progress. It can't be in progress because then it's in the workflow. So you can't just delete if it's in the workflow. So um and then also it can't it can't be converted to a PO because then that's like a record of of that PO. So um, once people started um, looking into this, using it, if we look through our requisitions that we have here, um, pending, so those aren't submitted yet, canceled or rejected, those are no longer in the workflow. So you could come in here and clean these up. Now, there was like the software previously sort of like assumed if it was approved, then it was meant to be converted. But um, totally understand that's not always the case. Like it could have been a requisition that got approved and then something changed. And if they never converted it, it could be years old, then they may actually want to delete that. So that's what was updated with this update. So in this case, I have, um, I have a couple of approved requisitions here, again, not converted. And if I look at this real quick, this one is September 28th. I don't want to jump around too much, so I'll just tell you September posting period is closed in this instance. And so now we can see um, I do have the delete button. I went in ahead of time. I made sure the other parameters, um, the module uh, is turned, the pre-encumbrance module is turned off. That rule is disabled. So um you know, all of my other qualifications for deleting recs are met. And now I have this approved requisition in September and I can go ahead and just delete that and it's gone. So um, if they're doing some cleanup, that's just another thing that um, is available to do as well. And then here I linked to this and this gives like the further detail on like what they need to do um, on those other things that I mentioned for um, being able to delete requisitions. Okay, and then the very last thing that I have for you today is for bug fixes, um, a recent change to the 1099 correction um, option introduced a bug for districts who do not submit their own 1099s. 
basically what happened is we added so um in this 1099 extracts you know i mentioned that this only applies if they um like the function that added the uh, being able to select the correction here and then having it require the vendor so this submission type is only going to show here if they're checked to submit their own 1099 if they're not if that's unchecked that's not even going to show so uh, basically we just had a bug where it was showing the error when it shouldn't <laughs> like if they don't have this submission type we fix that it's fine um so that you know uh and that went out earlier in december so um hopefully we were, we were able to catch that before too many people started running their preliminary reports so that's all good to go now okay all right, well, that's all I have for USAS. I think we're going to USPS next. Thank you, Amanda. No problem. Okay. Share screen. Let's see. I'm not sure if you can see my screen yet. Let's see. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, Happy New Year and happy Friday. Uh, this morning we'll be going through, and that's not the right one. So let's get me to the right screen here. And that is the actual releases. I gotta find where I did with that. Mm, let's see, lost my, there we go. What happened to my, I had it up there and it disappeared on me. So let's try this again. There we go. Found it. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. Now we're set. Okay, the first what we're going to go through is payroll and the um, bug fixes. And we had three regular releases in December, and then we had one hot fix. So the next first thing we're going to go through is the payroll posting um, for a bug fix. Um, a district noticed that the pay group date range when they had additions um, added with different um, beginning and end dates for pay groups, uh, that the pay date, um, pay stamp date was not getting um, on those in the attendance screen for those absences because um, it was looking at the original payroll date and ending and um, beginning dates. So that has been changed. So they should see a difference now when they view those absences and attendance, and those should have a pay date, pay date stamp on those. The next thing is the SERS pay report. Um, there was a bug when they had a negative error adjustment was added for a, um, a SERS employee. Um, they noticed that the um, it was not calculating the hours and um, days correctly for that. Um, now, when they run a negative error adjustment and run the SERS pay report, they're going to see two lines. They're going to see one line for the adjustment, which is the row 51. And now it's going to just give one day and one hour on that. And then they're going to show the other, the 01 row, um, it will show the rest of the days and hours. So it will equal what the report, pay report says for the days and hours. So that should be all corrected now. The next thing is a W-2 report. This, um, there was a Medicare um, issue, a bug when a district had, this was for actually one district, um, but it could happen to others that we found the bug. Um, there was an employee that had two full Medicare pickup items and they stopped one through the middle of the year and then with a stop date and then added the other one with a different payroll item. Um, payroll item number and 
when they ran the W2 report, it was creating a fatal era, error on there for the Medicare. And even though the amount was correct, but it, they were still getting that error. So now that has been corrected and they, um, if districts have this scenario, they shouldn't run into any other issues. Um, on the W2C forms, there was a bug that the employee name was not printing on the forms. So that has been corrected now. So if they have to run W2C forms, um, they shouldn't have an issue with the name missing. On the employee onboarding, um, a district noticed that a comp when they were creating the compensation and they checked the report to EMIS when they completed that task and they went to under core and compensation and checked that employee, the report to EMIS um, value was on check then. So that has been corrected. The next one is the audit report. Um, a district noticed when they were running it for a position, um, they were getting an error. And what it was, was a bug when um, it was looking at a building department codes and it couldn't be found. It was throwing um, a server error on that. So that has been corrected. The next thing is the SERS per pay report. The error adjustments was causing the 50s records to double on their report. So when they were ending an error adjustment on the 590 for an employee, and then they were going to core adjustments to adjust that total gross for the 400 and 590, it was doubling on the SERS pay report. So that bug has been fixed. The improvements for December, um, there was a request to include the SSD user listing AOS extract report in the monthly report bundle. So that has been updated. So now when they go to their monthly reports under file archive, they're going to see the um, name of the report. It's gonna show as user listing report. So now they'll have that every month if they need to go back to that. And the next thing is employee dashboard search box. There was some, um, they wanted to improve those, how to search that. So if you go to your employee dashboard, now, and you have several employees, maybe with the last name of Brown or um, O W N, type, and they will bring up, and then you know the employee's first name. So now you can do um, the comma, and it will bring up that employee. Okay. And then also now it will search by um, the employee ID. Okay. Right. Um, there was a bug that, or not a bug, but um, what happened when they introduced this release here for this employee dashboard, it was also including any archive employees that the district might have. So it was making a long list went under the employee dashboard and showing um, all the archive employees. Um, so that has been reverted back. Um, from that change. So now they should no longer see um, archive employees in the um, employee dashboard search name. The next thing is the payroll report. There was a request for improvement on that because the two payrolls, the pre-post, uh, pre-payroll report, and then the post-payroll report, um, the fonts were different. So there was just a request to make those um, exact. The next thing was the W2C submission improvement. Um, this was for allowing um, on processing of W2C correction records. So what that is, go to my thingy here. Where are we? Oh no, what I do? Ah, that was scary. Okay, we're back. Um, if you go to W-2 report, W-2 corrections, and W-2C records, if you have employees here that you have not processed yet and you're going to run and create this uh, file, so if you go now and you see this on process, oops, on process right here, this little box, you can't click on it right now. So if you have your employees and you need to create the submission file, you go to WC Correction Report, create submission, enter your information here that needs to be entered, and then generate the submission file. 
Okay. So now we see our W2C has been created with all those employees. If we go back to the W2C record, now you're going to see not all my employees are gone. So now you can go back and you can set it to true. These are the ones that have been processed. Now, if you need to reprocess, you forgot to add an employee and you want to reprocess that file and add an employee. So what you need to do now is go ahead and click those employees and click on process. That puts them all back to on process. So now you can create a new employee or update a file if there needs to be a correction, if they had it wrong, they can do that now. And then they can go back again, go back to the report and recreate that file with the added employee or the correction for the employee that you already had on the file. Same, but it, hopefully that's um, pretty ex explained. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, so that should be helpful if they have to recreate the file a couple of times. They just have to select and redo that. Okay. And also, just to let you know, um, they're using the W2 configuration under configuration um, it to determine if the ITC is going to um, send that file for them or if the district is creating itself and sending it themselves. So again, just a reminder, um, it still goes off of that configuration here, right here. So if the districts or the ITC, um, that's something between um, you and your districts, if you're going to allow them to do the W-2 submission, um, send that file directly to SSA, or you're going to um, do it for them. So again, you just have to remember this flag because that will set up that um, W-2 record, W-2C record correctly. So just a reminder on that. Okay, the next one is city tax calculations. This one has been going on for a couple of years now and actually it's finally been changed and now will affect any of your district's payrolls that have been ran as of January 1st for 2024. So again, as you remember, the old formula was this. And now the new formula is going to be, it's going to take um, how it's um, calculated in our software. It's going to take the city applicable gross, and then it's going to add any applicable tax employer amounts for that city. So again, you can find this out by going payroll item configuration. And then to that city and right here. So if these are checked over here, tax employer amount, it's going to add in that employer amount in the, um, it's going to add that in. So it's going to be your retirement if they have that selected to tax that. And also the employer portion of 692 or the 693, which is your social security, if they have that. So that's going to be added in to that city applicable gross. So again, they will just have to look at that city configuration to make sure what that city um, is taxing and how they have it set up. Then the next thing, it's going to subtract off any city honored annuities totals. So again, it's going back to this city configuration and it's looking at any of these city tax annuity options that are checked if they honor any of these. That's in that calculation also. So it'll subtract that amount off. And then it's going to take it times the percent of the gross, which is then using the actual payroll item for that employee. I don't think I have one set up, but you get the idea here. The percent of gross, it's going to take that percent of gross. If they have what percent of gross entered, then it's going to look at the tax rate. And that's how they're coming up with that tax withholding. So now districts should be able, um, when they're submitting or um, employees are submitting their taxes, this should not be an issue anymore. Um, so hopefully um, this will resolve um, any calculating issues. 
And again, I have that included in our documentation under core uh, payroll item. Oh, what's it here? And then under city. So if they ever have any questions exactly how that's calculating, they can go here and we have it right here. So it's under payroll item and city item tax. So we do have that calculation in there. Okay. The next thing is the employer distribution um, report. Um, again, we just had a request because they, um, they, I think the things were getting confused on what dates to use for that. And you always want to use the payroll date. So you're going to use the first pay date that you're searching for or running and the last pay date. So again, if you're using, if you're doing a pay, each pay, then you just use the same pay date for first and last. But if you're using um, a whole month of December pays, then you have to use what was ran the first pay date in December. And then what was your last pay date ran in December? So that's just a tool tip that we added here. So it's maybe a little less confusing for your districts. The Medicare tax item. Um, this was all done behind um, the scenes. It was just improved the performance of a non-inflated gross calculation. And then also on W2C report, um, they did some improving on the style. So that was done be behind the scenes. The next thing was a, a request to add the username to the um, us um, user. So when you're under system and user, and they're going in to change the password, it now has a username right there. So make sure they're probably having, you know, selected the correct one. So that was just a request. Okay. Uh, the other thing that was added was the tax tables for 22 and 4 have been updated. And then also the Social Security wage base um, that has been updated for 2024. Um, and just a reminder, if you do have employees with Social Security tax, um, that wage has been increased to $168,600. Okay. Any questions on those? Okay, we'll go ahead and move to the new features then. Um, the new feature is the new submission, uh, the W-2 submission summary file city report. Um, this has been asked by districts for many years. So um, now they have that for this year. Um, the first one is the CCA. And, and just to let you know, this will show if the districts are submitting or the IT is submitting. It will show um, on there. So they will see, oh, go to submissions here. There we go. They will see this new um, city submission file for both. So that will be there. So the first one, um, the CCA one, I don't have anything set up for CCA, so we'll go ahead to our, and you can find this under um, W-2 reports and W-2 report and submission, and you can see those here now. So now, um, where is it? Here it is. So your first one where we'll go through is the CCA one. Now, just to remember, um, it's going to show the city names, employee, employees process, the city wages, and the city tax withheld. For CCA and RITA, they're showing employees that are CCA and employees. So if they have a CCA record, but they have another city that they pay tax in, but it's not a CCA record or CCA um, marked as CCA on the payroll item configuration, they're going to show in both reports. So just a reminder on that. It's just not CCA employees. Um, they're gonna show both. So you gotta remember if your uh, employee has a CCA um, city marked, and then if they have another CCA that they pay or another a city that they pay into, they're going to show both here in the report. 
because both CCA and Rita want to see that. So just a reminder. And again, um, the CCA really hasn't changed. Um, it just the adding this report. Um, and again, like I said, if it's non-city, um, CCA city, they're going to show in here. And right now, the only way you can go ahead, if they want to make sure, um, if they need to get a total, um, we did. I did include that here in that you can look at the RS record in the submission file. Um, the taxable gross was shown position 309-319. And again, the tax will have held um, will show in the 320 and 330. So again, if they need to find that. But again, they'll show what how many is processed, city wages, and the city tax withheld. So hopefully this will help um, your district's balance a little bit. Because now they should be able to compare the W-2 report summary for that um, city name and then compare it to here. But again, they might be off a little bit if that employee um, is included in this file. So just a reminder. So the next one then is the RITA. And the RITA submission file looks pretty much the same. City name and the number of employees, the city wages, and then the city tax withheld. Now, the only difference for RITA, they're including both employees with RITA per item and also other cities that are not RITA also in the file. But also what it's looking at is, as you can see, the city wage share is zero. And if the employee is marked as employment, um, or excuse me, residence or on actable, it will not show here for the city wages. Rita only wants to see employees that are marked as employment on their deduction type for that city wage for their pay, on their payroll item. So this might be why you're seeing city wages as zero here. Still gonna show the tax, but Rita doesn't wanna know those if they're uh, marked as residents. Now again, same thing. Um, you can it should balance your W two report summary if they're all um, if that like your city tax eleven is all RITA employees with no other employees in, um, included in that. Then you can use your summary report. I have it here somewhere. Yeah. So then you can use your summary report to balance. And again, I included uh, out here. Um, and again, if they want to check that, um, they will have to add up those RS records on the submission file. So taxable gross in position 309, 319, and then the tax withheld in position 320 and 330 <clears throat> on that. Okay. Um, is there any questions on? Anything for the releases for December? I think I went through all of them. Yeah, and no pictures. Okay. Then if there is no questions, um, I will pass it on to Michelle. Have a nice Friday and a nice weekend. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year and happy Friday. Um, so what we're going to cover is um, what happened, uh, what took place in inventory in December. And then after that, I'm going to walk you through our new training page for 2024. We got everything set up. Yay. Um, so, but uh, registration is a little bit different. Um, so um, I wanted to walk you guys through that. Very easy, but I just felt like, let's let's just walk them through it so that they're comfortable with it. But before we get to that, let's talk about inventory here. Um, we had one regular and one hot fix in December. Um, the bug fixes that uh, were resolved is for those districts that were starting new in inventory that didn't migrate, starting a new instance um, in the redesign software. Um, they, there was an issue where if they tried to go to core fiscal year, may have received a null pointer exception. So during setup, 
you know, you're helping the uh, district get everything set up in inventory. And if you clicked on fiscal years, you could have received that null pointer exception method. Um, so um, we have resolved that, so that shouldn't be an issue anymore. Um, also, gonna, before I do anything, make sure my chat's over here. Questions. Um, another um, bug fix is underneath transactions with the filtering in the acquisitions and dispositions grid, we have made some improvements. So what you and your users may have run into on some of the fields that they were trying to filter on, some of the columns, um, they may have received like an internal error message pop up in the corner. I mean, you had to click on that to basically restart it. Um, so we have fixed that. And I have the specific fields that that was happening to. Um, also in the disposition grid, if they were trying to um, do a filter on both the tag number and the date in the disposition grid, they were getting that, oh, go ahead and increase this here, might be too. Here we go, hopefully you guys can see that better. Sorry about that. Um, if uh, they were having issues with um, you know, sorting on both of those, um, then again, um, it was giving that internal error message. So those have been resolved. I know we do still have a few more of those internal error messages pop up when you're doing filtering on the grids. Um, so they are looking into those. We do have your issues for those and those will get resolved as well. Um, another bug fix is transaction items, um, the split items in there. Um, we were having an issue when they were trying to do a split, and um, <clears throat> if that original item had an associated transfer, um, they would have re received an error. Um, so it wasn't, so let's say you were splitting a tag, tag number 10, and you were splitting it um, to 11 through 15. Well, it wasn't removing 10. If 10 had any associated transfer transaction. So we're still leaving it on the system. Um, and so we have since resolved that then. So that 10 will no longer appear. Um, and those are the bug fixes. Improvements. Um, uh, we did make an improvement, but it's something that you guys aren't going to be able to see. And it has to do with anonymizing data. And I know you and us have been waiting for um, an ability to create a test instance with anonymized data in VRA. Um, and what we've been waiting on is um, this last push with inventory to make sure that everything is anonymized correctly. And so they have finished that up. So we're at the point now where um, I believe they're going to look into getting that anonymized information out there in VRA to allow you to go out and take <clears throat> any of your district's data um, and make a backup of it and anonymize it. Um, so I don't know all the details on that. Um, once, you know, uh, the management council, the DCO team, um, and SSDT, you know, we all kind of get that going, obviously. Um, there's probably going to be some type of new catalog item out there that, um, or a new option within um, one of those where you're creating a backup um, test instance where it'll allow you to anonymize it. So um, keep my fingers crossed that um, we'll get that um, out there, hopefully, and available um, here near, you know, the first quarter of 2024. So I'm hoping to, because it's, it's really nice to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what we were waiting for was for inventory to do that last push um, and then hopefully get that out there in VRA. Um, we also had a specific patch related to a split. Um, it was for a specific district that we had to fix. Um, so that went out there too in December. So that's what we had um, in December for inventory. Do you guys have any questions on that? All right, well, what I'm going to do is I am going to take you to our training page here. 
and um, we have updated it. So we were down in the release recap. So I'm just kind of scrolling back up to the top and we have updated it to show all of our training sessions for 2024. So drum roll, please. I'll go ahead and click on this. And here are the training sessions that we have. Um, so if you kind of look, scroll down here, um, uh, we have a full schedule here. And so I just kind of wanted to walk through, you know, what we have here and then show you like how the registration process has changed slightly. Um, so down here, if I look at um, January, that will be our next one. And you notice we have a gap here. So we do not have any Fridays with fiscal sessions until the beginning of February. I know, and we know everyone's busy with W-2 and 1099s, uh, submissions, processing, printing, et cetera. And so um, very busy on our end as well with support. And so we decided to take a break here um, and allow everyone to get through calendar year end. And then we're gearing up in February for the rest of the year. So obviously the first session in February is gonna be our January recap. And so if we just kind of scroll down here, we have sessions for almost almost every uh, week here. Um, and so it's just kind of review. Again, the grid looks this, pretty much the same. It um, will specify the type of session. So um, as you know, um, Amanda and Andrea have said, we do have a W2C and 1099 correction session that's going to be coming up February 9th. So a pretty important one that we're going to review those new features, um, those new W2C, especially corrections, um, and run through that. And, you know, and like they had mentioned before, we didn't want to put the cart before the horse and talk about corrections now because you're working on just getting the W2s out there, right? Um, let's worry about any corrections that were, had already been submitted and correcting those in February. So that's why we're just going to um, hold off and do that session in February. Um, we're going to do our standard budgeting session. We do that every year. And, um, and then we do our overview session for USAF and payroll um, in March. And those are three-day sessions, a half day each day. And so um, for those of you that are new, you know, haven't gone through that, uh, maybe went through the recordings that we did last year, but you would like to actually attend the session this year, um, please sign up for those. Um, and uh, we will lay it out the same way that we did last year as well. We're doing like for payroll, uh, prepping for payroll um, day, the actual payroll process the next day, and then after the payroll process on the third day. And same thing with USAS, managing accounts is our focus the first day, expenditure second, and receipt process the third day. Um, and then in April, we'll do our inventory overview and go through those as well on a three-day type of schedule. Um, right now, too, we do have, um, and I, we just put this in here so that you're aware that, you know, we've talked about doing regional training, and that is on my list of things to get going here and schedule uh, where we're going out um, on the road and providing uh, software uh, training. So um, the week of April uh, 22nd through the 26th, that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday um, is when we're planning on doing that. So I just put that out there so you guys are aware. And again, like I said, that's next on my list to get scheduled. Um, in um, May, um, one thing that we have changed in regards to year end sessions that we do with you guys, is we used to have them all together on the same day or we were splitting out the payroll into two separate days and we changed that this year. It's like, let's, let's focus on having USAF um, and going through fiscal year end, calendar year end on one Friday. And then the following Friday, focus on payroll and go through fiscal year end, cal calendar year end. Um, that way you guys can put your USAS cap to focus on that and then take a breather for a week and then focus on payroll. Um, so uh, we just felt like that would be the best approach instead of just 
putting it all in a, 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 on one Friday morning. That's a lot of information. Um, so what we did for fiscal year end um, is we are putting these tests in inventory on only because we're basically running out of time uh, because we know that um, you guys are going to be doing your sessions with your districts probably end of May, beginning of June. Um, so we wanted to make sure that, you know, with an inventory not being very long, um, when it comes to fiscal year end and the checklist, we are going to focus on USAS and inventory on that May 10th date only. And then on May 17th, we will cover payroll and go through fiscal year end, payroll only on that day. So um, we wanted to let you guys know that that's, you know, a slight change that we're making this year. And then also what we focused on too throughout this period, May, June, July, August, is go and dig, do like a deeper dive into some of those year end processes. Um, for example, um, STRS, Oh, I'm sorry, May 24th, we're going to, this is a, a new session. Uh, we haven't cover, covered before, but in USAS, EMIS-related topics, such as the maintenance of effort, grant balancing, period age balancing back to USAS, those type of things where you get those questions from your districts um, and you just you know want to get a, a little better handle on the EMIS side of things. And um, so we're going to, talk about some of that stuff and how it relates to the fiscal year end in USAS. Um, in June, we're going to do a deeper dive into SRS Advance and talk about that and how uh, the system calculates the figures. Um, another thing is a deeper dive into invoicing. We're going to do that in June, especially there you're talking near the end of the year. Uh, making sure that, you know, your invoices are, are done and ready to go for the year, uh, properly marking them for inventory and things like that. So we're going to go through that. Um, also in June, um, and this may change, this particular one, employee self-service. Um, right now it's slated um, to be released in July. Um, and so we are going to obviously be doing an in-depth training with you guys on the new replacement for kiosk. And so we will be covering that. Um, this may be pushed up. It just depends on where we're at with everything. Um, but for now, we have it scheduled at the end of June. And that will probably be a longer session as well. And then in July, again, we're focusing on year-end type of related uh, subjects common EMIS errors and how to prepare for your end of year EMIS submission on July 12th. And then also a deeper dive into those uh, certificate reports and the spending plans. So we'll talk about that in July as well. In August, we'll go through um, initial, the new fiscal year for uh, payroll. I'll let the new year begin with um, L reporting. So we did that session last year and we're going to do that again. Um, and then um, that kind of ends like the year end type of subject uh, sessions that we're doing. And then we're gonna get into some more uh, deeper dives into use the report generation. We go through that every year. I think we all need to hear that every year. Um, it helps, there might be slight changes and stuff taking place. So we'll do a deeper dive into the reports again. Again, a follow up on employee self-service if we need it. So that's gonna be out there in August. <clears throat> and then OETSA will be coming up here in September. So I already have those dates out there in case you guys are wondering when that's going to take place. Um, inventory, we do have a couple inventory sessions in later part of the year, lesser known uh, options and procedures and in inventory. And also October 14th through 18th, again, we're going to do another on the road that week. Um, so we're doing one in the spring and doing one in the fall. Um, some more inventory sessions on gap reports and balancing. We decided to do that near the end in fall when districts are working on their inventory to get things going before um, uh, they close out inventory for the year. And then again, in November, we're again, splitting that out. Payroll is coming first this time. And on November 8th, 
We're just going to focus on calendar year end payroll checklist. Um, and uh, we're also going to discuss the quarter end balancing while we're talking about calendar year end. And then on the 15th, we'll cover USAS and cover the calendar year end for USAS. So again, splitting those up. And then in December, we have just a couple other um, the sessions here, accounts receivable. It's been a while since we've kind of covered the accounts receivable module. So we felt like this was a good refresher and or, or a more deeper dive into that. Um, so we're going to cover that on the 13th. And then the 20th, we're going to talk about mass change definitions, focusing uh, primarily on payroll uh, when it comes to that and year-end related mass changes that are being done. So yeah, so this is where we're at. So uh, a good schedule here, lots of good information. And so what's gonna happen is you're going to go in and register for these. Um, and so obviously we were doing this first one today. So when you're ready to go in and start registering for the sessions, you're gonna click here like you normally have, but you're gonna see things a little bit differently. And I'm gonna show you the screens that you're gonna see. So when you click to register, here's an example of registering for that January recap session. Um, so you're going to get the screen and it's going to say, you know, what you are registering for. And you're going to put in um, your first name, last name. You notice the little asterisk here. Those are all required fields, the email address and your organization. And so um, once you have that done, um, you click on register. And just to let you know, once you're done registering for your first session, you go to register for the next one. I believe the first name, last name, and email addresses which should stay in there. Um, you may have to put in your organization again, um, but that's kind of nice because those will already be filled in for you. So like I said, once you click on register, you will get a little pop-up saying that you have successfully registered for this session. And, um, and it does tell you that you're going to receive a confirmation email based on the email address you entered in the registration form. And so um, that email is going to look like this and it will say hello and it will tell you which session you registered for and the Zoom information. So what's nice here is that you can add this information to your calendar, whatever you know, you're using, whether it's Google, um, uh, Yahoo Calendar. Um, so, uh, so you're able to go in and either add it to your calendar or save the email so that you have the Zoom information available. Um, so when that day comes, you can find that email or go to your calendar where the link's at and um, you'll be logged into the session. So pretty easy there. Um, <clears throat> once you join the session, we go through the training, the training is, is done. Um, one thing that you're going to see is once it's complete and the session ends, you're going to receive a pop-up in your browser thanking you for attending the session and the evaluation form will be there at that point. You will not be receiving a separate email from us with the evaluation form link and your CEU form. Um, so when it, so it's going to be supplied here. And then it does say, please um, click continue to participate in a short survey. Really, it means the evaluation. I couldn't change the wording on this, but that's basically what it is. Um, so when you click on continue, it takes you to our evaluation form where you can quick fill out. Um, and that's nice because it's happening right then, right after the session. So please, you know, give us as much feedback as you can regarding the session. Any areas of improvement we need to work on, what was helpful, um, that helps us then to plan, you know, our sessions uh, better, you know, for the next one. Um, and then also, um, we do have, and if you, you know, don't get that link for the survey and you're like, oh, I didn't finish, oh, I didn't finish the evaluation form, we do have that available on our training page as well. Um, so we do have a separate link that you can go in and click on the evaluation form and fill in the information. Um, just going back here. And like I said, you won't get that email from us with the link, so that's happening right there. And also when it comes to the certificate of attendance, 
we are going to post the certificate of attendance out here after the session. And so, you know, if you attended the session, great. If you are unable to, to attend the session and you're going to review the recording later and still need the CEU form, great. Um, you will have the um, ability to get that CEU form that you need. Um, so it's basically going to be in a PDF format and with, you know, already signed. So you're basically going in and filling in your name and your ITC in order to complete that. Um, okay, I believe that's all I had to tell you guys. So um, register away, um, go ahead and, and start registering for these sessions. Um, again, if you have any feedback regarding the session, um, please feel free to email me. Um, you know, we kind of based this off of the evaluations last year, as well as some of the other requests that we received throughout the year, and felt like we had a pretty good um, list of um, training uh, this year. Okay, if you guys don't have any other questions, um, I you know, wish you guys all a happy Friday. Enjoy the rest of your day, um, and we'll see you guys um, in a month. Thank you.